We have been making our way through Ephesians, and this morning we're going to again jump forward to Ephesians 6 when it talks about honoring our mothers and fathers, and on this day talk about fatherhood, all right? Praise the Lord that God has made families. I just read today, as I was uh, sitting in my office this morning, that the number of folks in the United States who believe in God, that believe there's a higher power, has once again fallen to an all-time low. In 2016, I believe the number was 89%. Today, 81% of Americans who were polled said that they believe in God. What is happening and is there anything that can be done? Well, there is a connection between fatherhood and folks believing in God. Is there not? You just, you just heard it read in the baby dedication that, that fathers are to instruct their children in the way of the Lord. They are just to be the primary instructors along with the mother to teach children. So when issues are coming up in our day, we used to have what we called catechisms where we'd go through the major questions that would face children. We need to do that with our children. We also need to address current issues. When the world says to our children in the school system, you were, you were here by accident, you're here without any real purpose or meaning, or you can just make up your purpose or meaning, because you're coming from nothing and heading to nothing. We say, no, that's not what Scripture teaches. Amen? When the world gets confused about sexuality or, or gender or life, we speak into those things, the truth of the Word, and we do that with kindness and we do it with love. We know where they will attack the faith, and we, we raise up our children. Amen? I wasn't going to use this illustration, uh, and then I was talking to somebody this morning, and it popped into my mind. You know, I grew up in California and went to the public schools, and some of the public schools I went to, they weren't always the safest places, to be honest. And I experienced being bullied. And one of the things I remember my father taught me, who at the time hadn't yet uh, come to know the Lord, was how to defend myself. This is how you defend yourself. I thought about this morning, and I thought about, I'm not advocating us figuring out how to teach our kids how to, how to fight with their fists. Uh, not about violence. That's not the point. But, you know, as a, as a young man, my father saw that I was going out into a place that might not be safe, and he wanted to teach me ways to protect myself. That was in the physical realm. What about in the spiritual realm? Isn't that much more important? Son, I'm going to send you out into the world. Daughter, I'm going to send you out into a world that is going to lie to you. It's going to get you or try to get you to believe things that aren't true to tie your passions to things that don't matter. These are the, the, the things that are going to be out there, and I want to instruct you. You see, fathers exist to what? Just like everybody else, fathers exist to glorify God. We're here to show the world how great God is by loving God and by loving others. We're, we're on a mission to make disciples who make disciples. And, you know, and sometimes I hear folks say, well, that sounds like maybe that's a pastor's job. Making disciples is not a job just left for the pastor. And the best disciple-making institution in the world is the family. Right? And I believe, with all my heart, that I will be held responsible for leading my family in a godly way. 
I believe fatherhood is a great delight and it, also, it is also a great responsibility. Would you agree? And if you go into parenting thinking, I'm going to parent, whether you're a father or a mother, with the purpose of giving my life some sense of fulfillment, as Gary Thomas said, that'll probably go away with the first pack of Pampers, right? <laughs> Babies don't come thanking you for your effort, right? God didn't give us children so we could be, be made much of or so we could feel important. He didn't give us children, those of us who have children, he didn't give us children so that we could have something to brag about on Facebook. If you've been called by God to be a parent, you're a parent so that you can glorify God by making disciples who make disciples, so you can love your children and teach them to love others and to love God and to make disciples who make disciples. Amen? Parenting is also a great place where we learn lessons about where we still need to grow ourselves. Who? If you're a parent here, can anybody here say, I have nailed it, man. I have just, I mean, just come to me. I'll tell you how to do all the parenting thing because that, that was cake, man. It was, it was so easy. I didn't know it was going to be that easy. I got seven kids. I've never heard a parent. <laughs> parents say that, right? I like the guy who said, I used to have three theories and no kids. Now I have three kids and no theories. <laughs> it's hard. It's good work, but it's hard. And parenting re reveals those things about us, so we go, man, I wish I wouldn't have done it that way. Can you feel that? It teaches us some things about ourselves. Do you, do you ever see your kids doing stuff and then you're, you're reprimanding them, telling them you shouldn't be doing that, and then you, you kind of hear the voice of God saying, mm, are you listening to yourself? Right? You're like that four-year-old stage where they're, where they're saying, I do it myself. I do it myself, and you go, I'm going to be late to my meeting. Just let me fasten the seatbelt. No, I do it myself. I feel sometimes like the Lord, like, uh, Kevin, does that look like you sometimes? Did it come to me for help? You keep saying, I'll do it myself. I was uh, with some parents one time, and they were talking to me, and their kids started fighting over a penny. And she was saying, isn't that, the mom was saying, isn't that ridiculous? And I said, well, I suppose our Heavenly Father looks down to, at us a lot and says, look at them again, fighting over some penny. It's not really worth anything, right? I remember one time after uh, one of those incidences when I uh, really just learned that I had a lot to learn was uh, right after uh, we got Anna and she was really in love with her shoes. And by the way, if you say, man, why was she so in love with her shoes? Do you know what the world is like if you have no shoes? Can you imagine living four years of your life where if you got shoes, they took them from you and you never had them? So she was like, you're not getting my shoes. But she'd have a fit if you tried to give her a bath. She wanted to hold her shoes. She went to bed, she wanted to sleep with her shoes. And it was like the middle of the night and she'd lost the shoe somehow she lost her shoe it fell out of a bed I don't know where it went and I went in to try to help her find the shoe and she reached up and scratched me she did a lot of that and uh, when before um, she, she came to understand our love for her right and I was I was angry like don't you know everything we've done for you and now you're scratching me in the face it's your own shoe you lost you threw it and it's like the Holy Spirit said, don't you see yourself after everything I do for you? Right? And don't you have a double standard, by the way? If you were her and had been through everything she'd been through, you'd use it as an excuse to scratch people. Am I getting through what parent can do, parenting can do to our hearts? And what the lesson the Lord wants to teach us? 
So if you're here and you're saying, I'm not a perfect parent, or maybe I'm not a, not a, not a parent, this message, there's lots of that will apply whether you're a parent or not. True? Lord teaches us wonderful things. And I just want to say to you, all of that was to say this, parenting is hard. It's enjoyable at times, most of the time for me, but it's hard. And when my kids graduated or when they got married or now, um, as we're entering the grandparent stage where babies are born, I often t- catch myself saying, I hope, I, hope, I hope I did enough to keep them on the road following Jesus. I know, and then I realize it's not me, it's God. I have to, they have to learn to lean on God, not on me, right? But still, the parents, don't you sometimes go, I just hope I, 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 I pointed them to Jesus. I hope they follow the times I did the right thing and ignore the times I did the wrong thing. And I want to say here today, God's grace is big and his help is mighty. So if you're here and you, your parents disappointed you, God is there to meet you and to help you. And if you're here in your parenting, God's here to help you. I was just talking at the uh, Business 212. I get 30 seconds to say something. <laughs> and they asked me for, for thoughts for the day, or, and I said this. Christianity is about repentance, not regret. Regret looks back and says, I, I wish I wouldn't have, or I shouldn't have. And it concentrates on that which you cannot change, the past. Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of direction. That instead of saying, I, I should have, says, next time, by the grace of God, I will. I will rise up from this mistake and I will learn. Praise the Lord. The church of Jesus Christ is about repentance. All right. None of that was in the notes. Point one. We honor fatherhood by valuing children. Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. If you're a parent, that's a go-to verse for me sometimes to say, unless the Lord builds the house, the labor is... If you're a parent, a grandparent, or not a parent, but supporting other parents, no matter where you are in life, we need to learn that simple prayer is help. Verse 3, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemy at the gate. I have seven children, and sometimes when people say, that's a lot. Or someone will say, didn't you some, especially when we were younger, people would say, haven't you figured out yet where, we, where they're coming from? And I just want to say, kids are the best blessing in the world. There's all this controversy right now around abortion. I think we have to value life. We have to value children, no matter where they're at even when they're in the womb. Amen? What concerns me is, in all the debate and discussion, is we lose sometimes the value of a child. Don't children matter? Isn't God's heart for the children? Didn't he say, let the little children come to me? Doesn't he care when I walk the streets of Columbia and see children being exploited? Doesn't he care? Doesn't he want us to do something? Didn't God want fathers to be there to protect their children, to help their children, to guide their children? I told you about the father who told me that he had to flee from Venezuela. He didn't actually tell me. I, I want to pull up full disclosure. He told somebody else who told me about this story. But anyway, a father who was telling a story to one of the workers we were with who said, I left Venezuela. 
And I came here and I had a good job there. The only job I can get here is collecting garbage. And every day, somebody comes to me and says, will you sell me your daughter? Just for the night, she can still stay at your house. Aren't you thankful for a father who says, no? What you're saying is an abominable thing. You see, you don't get fatherhood right if you don't get the valuing of children right. When it's, when it's all said and done, children are much more important than any of the things that we run after, a lot of them. Any of those things that are worthless. Are you going to care that you have a bigger house or a bigger car or a bigger career or someone thinks you're cool? I think we'll give accounts before our Heavenly Father how we trade children. And I think God created fathers for the benefit of children. And what a horrid thing it is when fathers neglect or abuse the children they were given care over. Can I get an amen? Amen. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Our kids know what we love, don't they? If someone asks your children, what, do they, what does dad really love? What does mom really love? What are they passionate about? Would they say, God? And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You should teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lay down and when you rise, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Instruction of the Lord isn't about just sitting at a table and doing a devotion occasionally. It's about walking life together with your children. Amen? So these are the things I say. We, we value children. This, this is what I um, have found over the years to be true. And I wonder if you would say these things are true. We, we value children by spending time with them. Isn't that true? We find time for the things we value. I think it was Charles Swindoll one time that his daughter was talking to him really fast like this and trying to tell him all these stories about everything that happened in really blah, 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 blah. And he said to her, if you want me to hear what you're saying, you need to slow down and not talk so fast. You need to talk slow. And she said, I'll talk slow, Daddy, if you promise to listen slow. Heard a story of a boy who was really excited because his dad told him he was taking him camping for the weekend. He got everything ready. He was really excited. Dad said he'd be home right after work to take him camping. He sat there and he watched the clock and it got later and it got later and it got later. He didn't see Dad. Finally, Dad got home and he was excited. He said, I got the stuff ready. We'll load up the car. And his dad said, sorry, son, I'm really tired. It's been a long day. We'll, we'll go in the morning. So first thing in the morning, that, that young boy jumped out of bed, and he was ready. Dad slept in. It seemed like forever, and pretty soon dad got out of bed. Son met him and said, Dad, I'm ready. I'll put the stuff in the trunk. I've even started putting the stuff right by the car. Dad said, you'll need to get this stuff out of the car. I'm sorry, son. A business uh, meeting's come up that's really important. I'm not going to be able to go camping. The disappointing thing, that, that little boy, he took his stuff back in the house and he sat down. And then he looked out the window and he saw something that he never forgot. 
his dad grab his golf clubs, throw them in the trunk, and head off. I tell that story for this reason. What you do matters much more than what you say. Amen? On the opposite side, you have those days that you go, man, you've heard the story. You've heard many stories, not just one. You've heard many stories about children's lives who were changed because the dad spent time with them, enjoying them. Amen? We value children by spending time with them. Be, we value children by training them up in the Lord. If we really care about them, we're not going to want them to wander off. See, we value children by loving them and seeing them as a blessing from God. Do your ch- kids see, that, see that, that you value them, that you delight in them? One of the things I'm talking about parents who've adopted children as we have is do, do you talk about what you've done for your children? See, the, 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 the greatest sin of that night with the shoe is that I wasn't seeing the value of Anna. I wasn't seeing the gift she was to us. I was only seeing the work. Rules without relationship lead to rebellion. When people know that they're loved and valued, it changes everything. Gary Thomas says, Families start to break down, and marriages often break down, for that matter, when we stop enjoying each other. There is a place for discipline and sacrifice and commitment and perseverance, but an equally important place exists for enjoyment. Those who never take time to enjoy their family miss out on one of the most profound wonders God offers. Such people may be all about serving, all about effort, all about sacrifice, but they're also stuck in a rut that makes them seem joyless, empty, and ultimately miserable. This type of life does not adequately represent the character of God. It seems far more inclined to the religion of the Pharisees than the faith of Jesus Christ. One of the things I learned early, and I'm, I'm going to run out of time. I've got to keep moving because I love parenting. Oh, I was wisely instructed... to be careful what I ask for eye contact on. Because as a parent, it's really easy in times of discipline. You need to look look at me. You need to listen to what I'm telling you. You, and then lay down a rule. And then wonder why our kids don't really give a lot of eye contact. So I've got a long ways to go, but one of the things I've tried to do every once in a while at home is just say, look at me. What I'm going to say is really important to you. I love you. I value you. I'm so glad you're part of the family. We value children by delighting in them and enjoying them. It's, it's to this level at our house. If, if you don't enjoy our kids we're not going to hire you to babysit them. That makes sense? D, we value children by disciplining them in love. Proverbs 13, 24, whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12, my son do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof, for the Lord reproves him who he loves as a father the son in whom he delights. Hebrews 12, 7 through 13. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is testing you as sons. For what son is there whom the, his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live. For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplined us for our good that we may share in his holiness. Share his holiness. 
For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful, the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your droopy hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight your paths for your feet so that what is lame may be, may be put out of joint. Let me reread that. So that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Amen. All I'd say is, if we love our kids, we have to love them more than we love what they think of us in the moment. And there's a time to discipline. Um, I'm going with the Andy Griffith, the Andy Griffith show. You guys remember that show? You guys want to whistle the entry? Uh, no. That'd be really cool if everybody started whistling that right now. What? When a hobo tells Andy that he's found, um, when, a, when a hobo tells Andy that he should just let Opie decide for himself, Andy says, no, I'm afraid, I'm afraid that it doesn't work that way, right? You can't let a youngin decide for himself. He'll grab the first flashy thing with shiny ribbons on it. Then when he finds out there's hooks in it, it's too late. Wrong ideas come packaged with so much glitter that it's hard to convince them that other things might be better in the long run. That's so, that's so true, isn't it? As a parent, you have to try to say, look, you can't just let me help you understand where, there's, where that's going and train them up. All right, we've got to keep moving here. We honor fatherhood by honoring marriage. Malachi 2, 13 through 16. And this is the second thing you do. You cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring, so guard yourselves in your spirit, and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not be faithless. Hebrews 13, 4 puts it very, very simply. Let, on it, let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. So if we're going to follow fathers, we understand in Scripture the father is, is meant to be in a marriage covenant. That make sense? So I'll go fairly quickly through these points. We value marriage by, by abstaining from premarital sex, from, from sexual intercourse outside marriage. It may, I was thinking about it. some of these ideas, they seem they're old-fashioned, but they're still the Bible idea, right? It's still, if we, we value children, then we're going to value the, the way in which children's come into the world, and we're going to put some guardrails around it. Two, we value marriage by marrying a Christian who finds passion and purpose in Christ. If you value children and you want them to be raised up to be disciples, then you're going to marry someone who's going to hold up those values and instruct them in those ways. Not just, well, they mark the box Christian, but they actually live for Christ. Three, we value marriage by honoring our, mar our wedding vows, so staying true. You know, not wondering from that commitment. Third, uh, we've, we honor fatherhood by honoring fathers. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Proverbs 6, 20 through 24. My son, keep your father's commandments and forsake not your mother's teachings. Bind them on your heart always. Tie them around your neck. When you walk, they will lead you. When you lie down, they will watch over you. And when you awake, they will talk with you. For the commandment is a lamp, 
and the teaching of light and the reproofs of discipline are a way of life to preserve you from the evil woman, from the smooth talking tongue of an adulteress. So there's so much more that I could say, but let's go back real fast here as, I, as I'm closing it up. If we're going to value fatherhood and fathers, then we have to value children. And for fatherhood to put in a proper perspective, we also have to value marriage and who we're partnering with to raise those children. And then we have to just value the very act of being a father. And these are three closing points here. Fathers are honored when we acknowledge their importance in raising children. Fathers matter, okay? There are tra tra tragic situations that come up where the father can't be there. Fathers can die. There, there are fathers who neglect or get, a, get abusive, and, and we understand that. And there are cases where it doesn't work out, and the church needs to come alongside and encourage and help those single parents. Praise the Lord for his grace to help single parents. And if you're a single parent, we're for you and helping you. But we also believe that we shouldn't promote voluntary single parenthood. You see the difference? Two, fathers are honored when we do not undermine their God-given authority. It's, it's, it's not the school's job to raise my children up, it's my job. Right? And, and, and so we, we need to, we need to um, respect parents and fathers. Third, fathers are honored when we, encourage them, when we encourage children to obey them. Unless, of course, the father is asking them to do something that's contradictory to Scripture. I'm going to ask the, uh, the group to come, and we're going to close in a song. You know, no matter what's happening in your parenting, God is with, with you through it. Praise the Lord. No, no matter where you are, whether, whether you're a parent or you're not a parent, whether you're a father or you're not a father, we all have a role to play in honoring fatherhood. Amen? To say, we're not going to turn away from what the Scripture says about family. We're going to try to reestablish families. I know, I did jail ministry for many years. I know many men who had no father in their home that was there for them, who then raised themselves up by the grace of God and with the church coming alongside them and were great fathers. Praise the Lord. Just remember this. We're not about regret. We're about repentance. We're not about the past. We're about where God's leading us in the future. Amen? But don't let the world tell you that fathers don't matter. They do. Let's encourage them. Let's, let's help equip them. Stand with us and sing.